All right, I think I'm going to start now. So thank you all for coming by. Congratulations, you made it, the last session before closing session. And I hope you all have been having an awesome DrupalCon. My name is Matthew Tift, and I work at Lullabot. Uh, we're a design, strategy, and development um, company. Uh, I also, you can find my name in maintainers.txt under the configuration system. I maintain a number of modules and I formerly uh, worked in academia. Um, in, I have a degree in music history. I used to teach at the University of Iowa and I've been interested in critical theory for a long time, which is why today I'm here to talk about public sphere theory. And the way I have this structured is to make it as understandable as possible because this can be a quite complex topic. So I have four parts. The first three will take about half the time and I'll talk about Drupal, then public sphere theory, and then Drupal in the public sphere. And then we can chat about it <coughs> if you want, if you're awake still. So. Today, although I'm talking about a theoretical subject, I hope that what I'm saying is a kind of practical advice. That public sphere theory, for me, gives me a different way of conceptualizing Drupal, which in turn helps my interactions with the community and interactions with the other individuals. And I hope today then, not to try and criticize other views about the Drupal community. I'm not here to try and convince you of anything or convert you or relay some sort of hidden message about things that have been going on in the Drupal community. I am here to offer up some ideas that you may or may not find useful for yourself. So the first part, we'll talk about Drupal. Now, you've been at DrupalCon for <laughs> a few days, you probably have a good idea what Drupal is. And the kind of language we use to talk about it, we say it's a content management system. We say it's uh, developed by a community, which in Wikipedia has been happening since 2014. I don't know, maybe a little bit longer than that. <laughs> On the other hand, you could go to a place like the Linux Journal and read that Drupal is not a content management system. So the language that we use can be contradictory. And maybe you think Drupal is hard. We can use words like that. But however we break it up, uh, whether we say we associate Drupal with an organized group, like a local user group or an institution, maybe you associate Drupal with Lullabot or Palantir.net or some other organization you think to me, that's what Drupal is, or maybe an individual. Maybe you, you know, associate Drupal with Dries or with Alex Pott or Tim Plunkett or something like that. Uh, and then, you know, we also talk about Drupal in terms of the market. You know, Dries talked about uh, the idea of the enterprise label being slapped on Drupal recently and how he uh, presented a different label, which would be for ambitious web projects. So we have lots of ways talking about Drupal that are more than just the code, but I'm sure for many people that is the main thing that they care about with Drupal. So you could say, as the Drupal Association did a few years back, that Drupal has something for everyone. Or you could say, I work in Drupal and I'm going to measure like how an individual contributes to Drupal. We have this site that is, has not been updated for a long time, which is called Certified to Rock, where we, we measured an individual's contributions to the community. Uh, one of my colleagues at Lullabot once gave a talk about Drupal using, uh, uh, let's see, as would be a simile. Uh, he talked about it as a platypus, where we this uh, odd sort of creature that we have uh, assembled. So there's lots of different ways to talk about Drupal. 
And one that has gotten a lot of attention is this idea of Drupal as an island. And the idea being that the Drupal Island is this place where we all are. I guess it's sunny and, I don't know, maybe beaches or something. But no, the idea is that we want to get off the island and go look at some of these other communities, like go attend a PHP conference or something like that. But this idea, I've talked to a lot of people this week that have, have felt that this is, this is relevant, that we're an island. And this kind of thinking I've been sort of um, interrogating a bit more recently. Uh, Dries has talked about Drupal as a public good, which is a really different way to talk about Drupal because it's based on economic theory. At his keynote in Amsterdam a few years back, he compared it to roads or streetlights or parks or other types of things that benefit the public. And as a result, then he could look at issues like the free rider problem and trying to entice people to contribute to Drupal. So that to me seems like a very different way of understanding it. Uh, Dries and I also published a, a blog post after months of work looking at commit credit data where we said, who is contributing to Drupal? And then we tried to answer the question, who sponsors Drupal? So while we were doing this, I would talk about some of the things that we found, some of the data that we looked at. And one of the things I heard quite a bit was saying, well, how do you measure something like generosity? How do you measure how much time it actually took to create that patch? How do you measure that person who is uh, organizing a local user group or something like that in all of the effort that they have? Because that would never show up in a commit credit. And there's all kinds of examples of this that we can't really measure. So this idea of actually existing in Drupal, to borrow a phrase from academia, is, is a tough one to pin down. And as a result, I tend to like talking about Drupal just in terms of the way that we talk about it. So this, I wrote an article about this um, a few years back called The Cultural Construction of Drupal. And I talked about some of these issues, that we construct ideas of Drupal using these kinds of language, like an island, like a platypus, and that kind of thing. And if you're interested more, you can check out this article. But in essence, Drupal is changing constantly. We know not just the code contributions, but how we talk about it, how we understand it. All of these things contribute to our understanding of it and our participation in the community. And ultimately, I think it is really interesting to try and say, I want to measure this. I mean, how do, you, how do you relate that? How do you say Drupal is important because of blank, and as a result, we have this kind of relationship to it? Because certainly there are people in the community that have a real affinity for Drupal that you want to go give it a big hug and say thank you for everything you've done. And that to me is just kind of a fascinating question to try and understand why people come to the community. So one way of understanding that I think is through public sphere theory. And this brings us to the next section of the talk. So there are a few things that we can say about public sphere theory with relative uh, certainty. We can say that the term was coined by a scholar named Jürgen Habermas. We can say that Habermas um, is a very influential scholar. In a, There's lots of rankings where he shows up saying, hey, who are the smartest people on the planet? And he'll, he'll be up there. In this particular one from a few years ago, he was just after Elon Musk and ahead of Naomi Klein and Slavoj Žižek and other people who we think of as uh, influential, especially, or at least in the acad academic world. But even if you're not an academic, you've probably heard of Elon Musk, and to see Jürgen Habermas next to him might be kind of a, a shock for <laughs> some people. But I wanted to sort of contextualize the impact of this theory on other folks. So what is this theory? So if I was to boil it down, taking the you know, 
dozens of books that I've read on this subject and articles and that kinds of thing, I think this is one of the key concepts that we can find as useful. That there is an idea of a private realm and there's an idea of the state and then somewhere in between there's this public sphere. So this was key for Habermas's theory in that it was different from a setup where maybe there's an authoritarian telling people what to do. That the public sphere was not just this um, different place, but this influential place. And the theory is useful because it's both historical and it's what we'd call a normative ideal. And that's a very academic phrase that says, that, that says this is what it could be. This is like this idealized place. This is a, a place that, that is desirable. So by treating it in this way, we can use that sort of as a benchmark for how we're going about our our day-to-day -day interactions with Drupal. That the, the theory is describing a place that's both uh, no, uh, historical and idealized. And what is this place? Well, one way to understand it is thinking about an 18th century coffee house because the public sphere in Hager, Habermas's theory was actually a place. It was uh, in England, a coffee house. In France, it was a salon. In Germany, it was a Tischgesellschaften. So we had these different uh, like physical locations where people would get together and debate ideas. They would read the same journals, they would come in with ideas, and they would debate. So what did they debate? Well, they had, they had rational, critical debates, and that's one of the key ideas of this theory of the public sphere that people are offering rational ideas, that people are analyzing, that people are saying, here are some of my ideas about specific subject, and they're not just coming in with crazy ideas. So it's important in the public sphere, in this theory, that you disregard status, that it is a place where everyone is welcome, and it didn't matter if you were a lord or a working class person, that you came in and it was about the ideas that you had. What could you contribute to the uh, debate that was useful? And the debate was uh, often about unexplored topics. It looked into habits we had formed, ideas that we had held and said, why do we do that? So it's not about holding on to any own personal ideas, it's about saying, you know, we've thought about this for a while and why do we do that? So that would be the type of topic in a public sphere uh, location. And if you want to use some uh, big language, I guess, you could say that it freed society from domination. It was a, a place that had um, a very different effect from people who were told what to do. It had power. And, inter and importantly, the, the ideas that came out of the public sphere were legitimate because everyone was welcome, be in theory, because everyone could present these ideas, you would end up with legitimate ideas that in turn became uh, effective ideas. So to bring about change in the public sphere, in theory, it had to be legitimate, it had to be effective. And it's important to note then that the, as J John Dewey did, the distinction between the public, public or the private and the public is in no sense equivalent to the distinction between the individual and social. So it's not simply that people got together to discuss things, but they did it in public. So you could still have groups of people that are getting together in private discussions, making big important changes, but in the public sphere, it was about um, individuals getting together in a public place. So there's not just one public sphere. As I said, this was a phenomenon that um, from the 18th century onward um, uh, occurred in lots of different places. So there's no one public sphere. It's not a place where you go to talk about your feelings or why you're upset or something like that. It's about rational critical debate. 
It's also not a place where you engage in uh, commodity exchange. It's not about doing business. It is about the ideas again. And it's also not a place where you go to get good polling data or something along those lines. So it wouldn't be as though somebody is going to go into a public sphere or act in a coffee house and they are going to uh, you know, tally up everyone's opinion and based on that make a decision. That, that is also not part of what it is. Again, it's about the ideas, it's about the I debate. So no institution then can come in and sort of push their weight around. I couldn't go into the public sphere and say, hi, I'm Matthew Tift, I represent Lullabot, and here's the institutionally sanctioned opinion that we would like to present. It was not that, because again, that would go against the notion of it being classless, and it would go against the notion of, of the, uh, the importance of the debate and the individual in, as part of that group. So. If all that seems a little bit overwhelming, the basic things that I think you can pull from that is that we have a public sphere is inclusive, classless, and rational critical. So that's what I am sort of highlighting because I think that is perhaps uh, what can be useful for us as we look into the Drupal community. But lots of other people have used this to look into other communities. So for example, to give you a better sense of how public sphere is used, a lot of feminists have looked at this and said, public sphere, oh, that's different. Because people traditionally have thought of women's role as in uh, a, private, a private sphere, not out in public. So lots of feminists have looked at this and sort of interrogated the theory and understood uh, how women play a role in society in a different way. Black public sphere is another idea where you can, you can imagine maybe with what I've told you how, how different it would be to understand a public that is classless versus a slave society, for example. So there are all kinds of public sphere theorists. Uh, one recent was about, for example, YouTube as a public sphere. And I could go on and on, but uh, I, I just wanted to highlight one that I thought is particularly relevant for our purposes, which is this idea of a transnational public sphere. So that might sound like a big, hard to understand concept, but basically the theory that I had mentioned before, talking about public sphere as between private and the private realm and the state, Nancy Fraser looked at that and she said, well, that's not really relevant to us anymore. And she said, there's not just one state that people are uh, trying to influence anymore. We are all people from lots of different countries. I'm sure just in this room, for example, we're all people from lots of different countries. And what we're trying to influence is maybe a, a much more amorphous than we're trying to influence one particular government. So the transnational public sphere reconceptualizes the public sphere as influence by looking at what the influence is. What is it trying to do? And uh, our keynote speaker today um, has highlighted in one of her articles, because she's a public sphere theorist um, of sorts, um, she wrote an article in a peer-reviewed online journal, by the way, called, or not peer-reviewed, uh, peer uh, open access journal called The First Monday, and she started off by saying, the emergence of network technologies instilled hopes that interactivity in the public sphere could help limit or even cure some of the ailments of late modern democracies. So, big words again, uh, trying to affect democracy through the public sphere. So this, this theory can be used in all kinds of different ways. And I want to talk a little bit about how we might use that to understand the Drupal community in a different way. So you may be sitting there thinking, wait a second. We don't go to coffee houses and argue. We sit at home in our underwear and get our work done. And we play video games. We don't talk to people. That's not relevant for us. And if I do go to a coffee house, it's not a bunch of old white guys in wigs. 
I'm going to be sitting there with my facing somebody else's back, and I'm going to be there because they have good Wi-Fi and cute little flowers in my coffee. And really, come on, Drupal is about business. So I would not particularly want to get into big arguments saying those things are incorrect. However, I would like to highlight some aspects of the Drupal community that I think are relevant for public sphere theory. And I think we have our own public spheres. So for example, the IRC. This is one of the key ways that members of the Drupal community can uh, communicate. And we have handles where we don't necessarily know who we're talking to. We don't have a, a place that is moderated with an agenda. You go into the IRC channel and you present your ideas or you say, I have a problem with this and somebody helps you out and somebody else might say, oh, that's not quite, quite correct. But it is this sort of classless place that we don't necessarily know who we're talking to. Or our issue cues are similar in that way. And then there's the human element too. We, we value being human in the Drupal community and we, lots of us attend local user groups, Drupal camps, Drupal cons. And in these places, we allow for debates. And so often, we'll say things like, well, the really important conversations that I had at DrupalCon happened in the hallway. And that too is another sort of public sphere kind of place where you, it's sort of you happened to cross someone else. You, you had a discussion, you worked something out, you did it in person, you, you, you created a, a new idea, you, you interrogated some sort of pre, pre, uh, pre, determined idea that you were going to question. So we have these kind of, kinds of conversations. And the agencies that a lot of us work for, they believe in open source values and they promote those through articles and podcasts and speaking and we contribute to Drupal core. So I see that there are not just uh, people that are working for themselves or working for an agency, but they're participating in these places and they're doing so in a variety of different spheres, if you will. So I have my own podcast and I give it away and I offer my opinions and I debate people on the show or I ask them the tough questions. So these are the kinds of things that I think uh, reflect well on our community is when people are doing this kind of thing, sharing these ideas in a public way, and that that is the kind of part of our community that is important. So what then are we influencing? What does the Drupal public sphere influence? So you could say that we influence uh, the public good in general, or you could say, we have some sort of influence on states. So we have a, a wiki page on Drupal.org that lists more than 150 countries that are at some part of their government using Drupal. And that's, that's more than three quarters of all the countries in the world. So you might say, well, you know, they're just using the software, it was a business decision, it was about accessibility or something like that. But I would at least like to think that maybe the, the, the practices that we've adopted as a community have some influence in these countries in how people interact. Maybe there's something there. Maybe that's a stretch for you. Maybe you think, well, do you have specific examples? And we heard about one this morning in the introduction to our keynote about the first Drupal distribution to help empower one particular presidential campaign. So this is somebody who was motivated in the Drupal community and wanted to take Drupal and do something specific with it. And here is uh, one potential place where we could look at as a site for influencing uh, governments. Or it's just people. In 2013 at DrupalCon Portland, more than 70 developers got together to help some uh, victims in Oklahoma City of a tornado. And they were, uh, the, the community was devastated by this and the Drupal community, or one, one, one section of that, helped, tried to help those people in the way they knew best. 
So this was an example, again, of people getting together saying, how can we help? How can we, what are we, how can we, inf how can we have some influence for good? Or another more recent example is uh, Drewtopia, which is a, there's been a couple of boffs, I think, that have mentioned Drewtopia. I know some of you were there at one of them, because I was at least at one of those. And it's, again, a group of people that said, hey, there's something about our community values. There's something about the way that we do things that we think we can use this software for good. And these are the kinds of things that I hope that we can continue to cultivate. So typically when we talk about Drupal and the community and growing the community, we will talk about things like sprints. As a speaker at DrupalCon, one of the required slides that I'm supposed to have is mentioning the sprints tomorrow. We're all supposed to go to the sprints and sprint. And the page that describes this has some information uh, about how it works and that sort of thing. There's not a lot on that page that talks about why. Why do we sprint? Why do we try and get new contributors to the community? What are we trying to influence in those practices? So maybe we would think, OK, I'm going to go to the sprint, because currently, as of yesterday, we had 106,840 active contributors. And I think we need to get that up number up above to more like 106,900, because then I would feel good about my community. Then I would feel good if we had that commits closer to 3,000 or something like that. And I honestly don't think that many people in our community are driven by metrics like that. I don't think that's why most of us contribute. I don't think those sorts of numbers would somehow explain why people want to go hug a giant blown up DrupalCon. So why? Well. Uh, Tocqueville has an interesting quote to this effect. And I think it can help us out a bit. So I'll read this. He says, each person withdrawn into himself behaves as though he is a stranger to the destiny of all the others. His children and his good friends constitute for him the whole of the human species. As for his transactions with his fellow citizens, he may mix among them, but he sees them not. He touches them, but he does not feel them. He exists only in himself and for himself. And if on these terms there remains in his mind a sense of family, there no longer remains a sense of society. Now these words struck me pretty hard when I first read them because I used to tell people what really matters, the only thing that really matters is the health and well-being of my friends and family. And I used to believe this, and I'd tell people that, and they'd say, yeah, that sounds about right. The health and well-being of my friends and family. And this Tocqueville quote suggests that if you believe something like that, well, that's going to, re that's going to result in the decline of society. That we need to do more than just do things for our friends and family, that we need to get together, that we need to meet new people, that we need to interact, that we need to share our values, that we need to have these debates in the public sphere. So I'm not up here suggesting I want you to increase your commit credits, and if you can't you know, do code, you need to come up with some new revenue models or volunteer some more time or convince your company to sponsor. These are the kinds of things we hear quite a bit. But instead, I'm saying, and this is not directly public sphere theory, but we need to refrain from divisive speech, share our knowledge, act with compassion, and follow our code of conduct. So with that as a base where we are considerate and respectful and collaborative, we can then look maybe at other parts of our code of conduct and, and, and interrogate some of these words. So we say, as our community grows, it is imperative that we preserve the things that got us here, namely keeping Drupal a fun, welcoming, challenging, and fair place to play. So maybe you read those words and say, yeah, let's just make Drupal fun. Let's make it challenging and uh, uh, playful. And for many people, I think that does speak to them. But I kind of look at that, those words and I think, 
I think there might be something more that influences how people are participating. And I think that uh, looking at that through the lens of public sphere theory, <laughs> that, that we, could, we could think about it differently. That we could say, uh, we want to be part of something greater. So th th I saw this the other day and I, I can't honestly remember or I don't honestly know where this comes from, and if you Google these words on the internet, it, you won't find an answer, but I read this and I thought immediately about the Drupal community. The expectations of a wise water drop. I don't want to go alone in selfish pursuit of my own path, for I only dry up and disappear. The place for me is a reservoir where I can live forever as part of something greater. So, that to me feels like Drupal. Like, I feel like I'm participating in something that's greater, something that's good, something that's helping people. And whether or not that's real, whether or not that's like a historical fact or something that I'm, I'm imagining, it's something that I want to cultivate. And as a result, then, I, 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 I want to look more closely at those unexamined aspects of our interactions. What sort of habits do I come with? This is my eighth DrupalCon, and you know I have ideas about. Oh, you know when I'm at DrupalCon, I want to make sure I see Tim and hang out with Mike, and you know I I know I'm going to want to go to the keynote and the Dries note, and I have these sort of habits. But then I kind of want to look at, well, do I have enough time in there to meet new people? Am I am I missing out on those interactions? Am I am I uh, simply just you know, catching up with anyone, someone in particular, or am I here to try and affect some sort of change? And I think each of us could ask these questions, whether we're here for the first time or we've here, been here many times. You know, what expectations are we coming to Drupal with? Where do those come from? And what might we want to consider as um, something that, that, that we want to cultivate, something that we think is beneficial versus something that maybe there's some aspect of the community that we, we might not um, find as useful. So some of the questions then that we could, we could ask are, are our spaces inclusive? Do we interact in ways at our parties, at our keynotes, at our sessions in the hallway that are, that are open to everyone? Do we, do we, play, do we really p provide a place for rational, critical debate? Do we allow any sorts of crazy ideas? Maybe the sense that I'm standing up here behind this podium is one sense that we do, so that's cool. <laughs> do we disregard status? Do we, do we question unexplored topics? So all of these, these aspects of the public sphere theory, we can sort of hold them up and say, how does, how does our community do that? How do we contribute to the public good? How are, are we are we helping? And if so, it, it, are we just here because we want to try and get another client? I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm saying is if you really look at that, you say, is that why you're here? Is, is it because the good code, more clients, I can support my family? And I'm saying this as a guy who writes Drupal for a living, and I'm telling you now that when I really think about what motivates me, it's not just to get another client for Lullabot. And one of the easiest ways I think we can do this, whether right now, whether you leave this room or a week or a month from now, is think about those times or notice those times when you think Drupal is like this. Right now, talking about ideas about Drupal for me, that's Drupal. Watching Dries's keynote when he says, I'm gonna talk about the technology, and then he proceeds to show us six videos of people and stories about people that contribute to Drupal. When I saw that, I thought, that's Drupal. It's about the people. It's about some guy in an island off the coast of Spain making everybody laugh, saying, hey, I saw somebody on the road, and they recognized me. That's Drupal. I mean, that's why 
I think that's why a lot of us get motivated, that we see somebody else and we, we think, oh, well, they use Drupal, then we have these sort of expectations around them. And I think when I see stuff like that, I say, yeah, Drupal's like that. And I want to cultivate those things. And there's other aspects of what happens at these conferences where I think about, why are we doing that? No, I don't know if that's good for the community. So again, I'm not here to try and tell you what to believe, but I'm here to ask you to notice. And I'm here to say, one way you can think about it is this idea of the public sphere, that we can't really measure a lots of these kinds of contributions, but we can alter our perception of the community, the way we think about it, the way we talk about it, to say, here's what we are, here's where we fit in, we're separate from the private realm, and we're trying to influence something, and we're going to do something that works well for our values, and let's cultivate that. So, with that, I would like to open it up for discussion. Could you speak into the, the mic? Okay. Thanks. Um, I just want to point, my background, uh, I'm a, a psychologist. So when you said the part uh, about uh, we cannot really measure, we can actually do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think it would be actually helpful. Uh, mm, my thesis was uh, uh, about the uh, mental construct. I don't know if you're familiar with Moscovici, but it's a, a French-Russian uh, um, theorist. That, and uh, you can actually measure the interaction between all this area and the mental construct of Drupal and see how interfere with all the uh, area of our life, uh, you know. It's not an absolute measurement, but you can have point of reference uh, between, uh, 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 I don't know, what's the public sphere and what's uh, the uh, private sphere, what's uh, the mental idea of work, uh, how much is, uh, you know, for example, how important is for us uh, as, uh, um, as a simple way to put food on the table or how much important is for us as a community, you know, things like that. So how, how do you measure then? Hey, uh, questionnaires, you know, that's the, 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 the best things, you know, and, uh, you know, since uh, most of us are online all the time, uh, you know, it's relatively easy to get something like this uh, through the community. At least the people that are more involved in the community would be probably interested in something like this. Okay, sure. Yeah, I think, I think there's a value in trying to find ways to measure. It just can give us a point of starting a discussion, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so l last, last fall when Dries and I looked at commit credit data, it was one effort to try and measure, to try and say, how, how are people contributing? Well, well, what can we sort of measure? What, and, and one of the things we had come up with as well, we can say, d did, did I write this code sponsored by a company or did I write this code as a volunteer? And we found that 69% of the code that, was, that, was, that had a commit credit information was sponsored. That you know, almost three quarters of the code that goes into Drupal core was, was code that, that people were writing while they were getting paid. And that, to me, is, you know, uh, it, it's interesting. And it, it, from there, we can, we can maybe ask other questions. We could, we could then, you know, one of the, some of the stuff I started to do and that we're going to do is to say, well, let's, let's see what we can do to compare those commit credits to profile information and look at, say, gender information as compared to c commit credits. How does it change over, you know, at a DrupalCon? How does it change when we change the rules about being able to maintain a module? So there's all kinds of interesting things that we can kind of, well, we can sort of uh, measure. Uh, I guess what one of the points I want to make is, is that, that 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 measurement is just, 
it's it's difficult to to get a full grasp of all of that that there are so many different things and that part of what we can do is to to notice it for ourselves what why we why we participate and then to sort of cultivate those values uh, <clears throat> this is Tim uh, thanks Matthew um, so we have these community discussions going on right now and I think a lot of these are about figuring out what the community is um, one of the things we were I went to one yesterday and we were talking about or I was thinking about the Drupal project versus the Drupal community and I'm trying to figure out if these are different things or if they're the same thing I think some people are uh, that, that the idea come for the code stay for the community some people are really you know their connection to Drupal is the code it's a tool that they use they might contribute to the code but that doesn't necessarily mean that they imbue the community with any extra, you know, that there's any extra value in the community for them. I think, um, you know, we've talked about this before. There are people like myself who really, the community itself, in a lot of respects, takes precedent over the code. Mm. I'm very much attracted to the, the Drupal community and like the fact that we're producing good code that's useful to make the world a better place. Um, I think, to the extent I have a question for you or anybody in the room, is does this public sphere theory at all help us, help me figure this out? Like, what's the difference between the project and the community and or how do I make sense of that? I'm thinking, you know, is in your, your idea, the, pri the, the public sphere being between the private and the, and the state, you know, is could the Drupal project, in a sense, the code and, and that be the, the state? <laughs> and that we've got a bunch of individuals and companies and then we've got this community in between the two. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody. I'm just figuring this out. I'd be curious what anybody else thinks. Yeah, me too. Anyone else wanna? <laughs> it's actually a very interesting question and I feel like there's a lot of overlap and it's, and it's hard to, you know, the public sphere is kind of an amorphous thing because like, so I work at a company that, um, you know, obviously it's a job, I'm getting paid and thankfully paid fairly well, <laughs> but, uh, but it's so much more than that because of the, what the work that we're doing is, is informing the larger public on issues that are, that are affecting them even when they don't realize it. And we're trying to sort of educate and inform in a kind of fun fun way that's easily consumed and shareable and and we're actually having an impact because I was literally in a bar in in Brooklyn and the bartender's you know knows where I work and he says, Oh my sister was visiting last week and she said, I got this great new site to tell you about and it was ours. So like you know we're we're doing a public good even while we're making money and you know and I think that's kind of true of the Drupal community too we, we, we do do both simultaneously in a lot of cases um, and I, I also spend a lot of time in the political realm and I do a lot of volunteer work with Drupal for political type things I mean so we kind of do both yeah I think it is difficult to sort of tease out the differences between those things. Like, you know, like I said about Dries' keynote where he said, I'm going to talk about the technology. There's been a lot of pain and suffering in the community and I'm going to talk about the technology. And that, that to me was totally fine. I, I didn't hear other people like complaining. Oh, he's not talking about the technology, you know, instead he's showing this video of this, this woman, you know, uh, talking about testing, you know, that kind of thing. So, so teasing those out, uh, you know, I guess I would say, you know, what would be the advantage to sort of differentiating those things? Like uh, what, what, might, what might be gained by, by, by saying, well, you know, really the code of the community, same thing. And if that's the case, well, what does that mean? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure that, that, um, that making some sort of uh, uh, conclusion as to, 
well, I think this way versus I think that way might, might change how we'd go, go about on our day-to-day -day basis. But I think what helps me with the public sphere theory is the interconnectedness between our different activities and uh, the influence that they have on something else. That, that to sort of offer a different narrative that we're not, that we're not an island to me, to me actually helps me think about the, the repercussions for what I'm doing. I, I think it's so easy sometimes to think, to get lost in the code, to say, I'm, uh, here, there's a bug, so I'm fixing it, you know? And that, that on its own, it's easy to think of that not having any sort of influence other than I fixed the bug and now the code works better. But then if I say, well, well what bug is this fixing? What module is this affecting? And how is that module used? And you know, what organizations use that module? And what people are affected by that? So just sort of reminding ourselves perhaps more often that, that, those, that those choices have repercussions. And um, the, the theoretical stuff can be interesting. I mean, I personally would say something like, well, there's no difference between the code and the people. <laughs> But that's, that's like getting into philosophical or religious grounds or something like that. And, and I don't know how helpful that is. That seems to just cause more uh, angst with some people. Mateo, the star of DrupalCon. <laughs> um, something that happened in my town was that uh, someone went to visit an African country they didn't get their shots. And uh, they came back with a highly contagious airborne disease. And uh, we live in a country where we have universal free healthcare. He was very poor. He was homeless, basically. And uh, since everyone contributed to have this very expensive healthcare system, we were just safe. Like, I probably am not dead because many people contributed to something that they were not gaining immediately from, but they are protected by. Many times when I work with Drupal in the, in the issue queue, I can just solve my problem and do code. I multiply the time that I spend with, the, with these issues by three times probably, by making sure that I put a UI on top so someone that doesn't know code can go and use that code. Because that's the triple way, right? We've been doing this, uh, we've been doing it like this forever. Like, it's almost like uh, an automatic thing that we do. I think that the both stories are connected in the way that I like to be in my day-to-day -day society, my day-to-day -day Drupal society in a place where people are more empowered, therefore are happier somehow. They can, I don't know, maybe afford to just live where they want to, like I do, because they can work from home. They have secure work, and uh, I don't think about any of this, right? Um, I just try to do the thing that I feel it's the best. Sometimes it, it feels that it's the technical challenge, but I think that somehow the philosophy in Drupal is affecting my actions, so I can create a greater good where everyone is safer, and thanks to this kind of mindset that we have, uh, we are affecting everyone else's kind of state of life, like empowering all people that kind of makes, like for me, both things are deeply interconnected and I don't know, I don't know if there is a separation between the two. That's a good point. I'm Manning and um, there were, this was awesome because it's helped me rethink everything that's been happening in the last month. Um, and thinking of it in terms of the public sphere and making reason-based arguments and decisions. And, um, but there are two slides that you had that were very striking to me. One was the code of conduct where it said, um, we wanna keep it fun, which is what brought us here. And that conflicts with 
when you said if you're thinking of yourself and your friends, you're not thinking of society, you've withdrawn from society. So if we're thinking about what made it fun for us, that will continue to attract people like us and not grow the community. So what brought us here might not be the same thing that are gonna bring other people that we need to have a, um, a bigger community. Uh, uh, not just like us, to think of the, the social public sphere aspects of Drupal. So I like those two together, and that might be part of the problem with our code of conduct, is that we designed it thinking how we can keep it f for ourselves, instead of thinking how do we expand it to more people. Hmm. That's, all. That's not a question. <laughs> yeah, that, that brings to mind all kinds of, of issues about you know, why the, the code of conduct is in place, why are we having these listening sessions now, what's gonna happen with the data from those listening sessions, is that gonna be a process that just ends at some point and then we have new rules and we're gonna stick with those or is that an ever sort of growing, changing process that we need to constantly be evaluating and uh, if, if we say we like the community the way it is, and we want to grow it, and we want to have more people. That has a particular sort of appeal to certain folks, you know. Uh, growing the community, more numbers. I wrote an article one time called Better Than Bigger, uh, which was actually sort of critiquing Dries's ar his, a lot of his arguments in his Amsterdam keynote, saying, well, let's, look, let's not look just at why we're why we want to grow the numbers, but how we want to sort of cultivate the community we have and make sure we have processes in place that make it welcoming to everyone, both the people that are in it now and the people that we want to attract. And I certainly agree that we want to continue to attract a broad, diverse group of people in this sort of classless society, this ideal. And to me, that's very appealing. And you know, super challenging to try and put those into words if we're gonna say those are the words. On the other hand, I do feel like um, with some of these recent events, I think it's important to, to say what are the limits of our community? What, what do we absolutely not stand for? What, what are those things that are not changing values that define the Drupal community? And those are really hard questions, of course. But I think those are all sort of related to this idea of growing it, making it more diverse, and then sort of dealing with the issues that come when we grow the community, when we say we're making enterprise software now as opposed to personal blogging software or whatever we might have said before. So I would, I would just say we want to not just grow the community, but grow as a community. Mm much more poetic. Man, I wish I would have thought of that when I was writing that article. <laughs> sure. um, maybe just a snarky remark, but I don't think that DrupalCon is a classless forum of debate, because, I mean, it, it is 500 bucks, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally agree. Can I move another criticism? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Since we st he started. <laughs> now, I was saying, uh, as a novice uh, to Drupal, and uh, um, one thing that uh, I, and connecting with the previous uh, um, debate that we have uh, about how difficult is Drupal to learn, mm -hmm. I think, uh, the, an effort uh, to make uh, Drupal more accessible would uh, actually increase the amount of contribution and uh, uh, the, 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 the community will make it much easier to be, uh, because uh, otherwise, uh, what do you have? You have a situation where uh, a company that wants to move uh, toward uh, freeware and has to deal with uh, support a company that costs $50,000 a year and uh, makes it impossible for a small entity to get access to this community. Just that. 
Yeah, we've made those decisions. <laughs> we, we, we have decided we're fine with complexity. Yeah. We're fine with it being hard. Certainly. And again, this, this gets back to the whole difference between like this is how it is and this is how we'd like it to be. And, and, and we can sort of debate all these kinds of things about how it's been, the, the whatever, but in a way there's the sense that we have something, we're stuck with it, what we have now, and we can make some choices now going forward. And how do we make those choices? What, you know, now that we have the situation that we're in, we can decide we want to do this based on these particular ideas. And I think that, that can be a real effective way of bringing about the change rather than necessarily re, sort of um, rehashing or bringing a lot of the feelings into it. I mean, I know feelings are important for, you know, we don't want to like hurt people's feelings, but. Last question or comment, Tim. Sure. You get it. Uh, just one sort of last comment. I'm, I'm, I mean, the idea that sure, it's hard to distinguish, like my idea, the, the, the distinction between the project and the community, it's clear those things are intertwined a lot. But I think we're fooling ourselves if we, you know, they, we don't talk about the fact that they come into conflict, right? We have. If you're purely looking at Drupal as a technical pro project and you, you, you establish your goal is to make the best possible technical project, the best possible CMS, you may be pushed in the direction of making decisions which are not necessarily in the best interest of the community, which may exclude certain people from the community or push them out. And I think we're experiencing some of that, I think, with Drupal 8 right now, right? It's, you know, I think most people would agree that technically Drupal 8 is a better product than Drupal 7. But we are, I think, leaving 